All right, welcome folks. I'm still seeing a couple of people trickle in. Um, so get comfortable and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am really excited to kick off this conversation um, with my guest today, Connor Shaw. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Birnbaum. I'm J Street's National Political Director. Um, and I'm really excited to be having this conversation today. Uh, we are just three weeks out from the midterm elections, less than three weeks. Um, and as polls have started to tighten across the country, um, one ongoing anxiety for many of us is the threat to our election security. This takes uh, many forms, from the hundreds of election deniers on the ballot this cycle, to threats against poll watchers and election officials, to concerns about actual violence after the fact. So this is something that all of us, our J Street, um, are deeply concerned about. So I'm delighted to have here today Connor Shaw, who's the Deputy Director of Policy at CRU, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, um, which is a great acronym. CRU uses aggressive legal actions, in-depth investigations, and innovative policy and reform work to achieve the vision of an ethical, accountable, and open government. Um, Connor is an attorney who received his JD from the University of Chicago, uh, where I went to undergrad, Royal Runes. Um, prior to his work with CRU, Connor was a clinical fellow at the Federal Legislation Clinic at Georgetown University. Um, he served also as a law clerk to a judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Vermont. So thank you again, Connor, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, we're going to begin today's webinar with a moderated Q&A, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from viewers uh, in the second half of the discussion. So if you have questions as we go or as they come to you, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So to start things off, Connor, um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and the work that CREW does to help protect our democracy? There are a lot of players in this space, so can you tell us a little bit more about your main areas of focus and how you interact with other organizations in this space? Um, sure. And thank you, Laura and J Street for having me today and for everybody who's uh, joined the discussion today. Um, I joined CREW in 2017, um, right after our democracy turned, uh, made a sharp turn in a, in a direction that I'm sure everybody found very troubling. And since then, I and CREW have been focused um, on a lot of, you know, the ethical lapses that we've seen over the last several years. Um, you know, focusing on efforts to secure accountability um, and increasingly also to um, sort of protect democracy from a lot of threats that seem to have um, just commingled, let's say, um, you know, with, with the way the Trump administration ended on January 6th, we saw strains that had been there the whole time, like, you know, nods to white supremacy and um, violent elements of the right, uh, breakdowns in the rule of law, and also just overt attempts to, to interfere with voting and election processes, all of those kind of came to a head then. Um, so we continue to um, you know, try to find ways to, to, to make sure that the folks who are responsible for holding people accountable have the information they need, have complaints in front of them, and, and then have the opportunity to make the right decision. So you mentioned it in your introduction, you know, we try to focus on you know, um, on legal processes and complaints that can lead to tangible results. Um, so, you know, that can take a variety of forms, but we, we're always looking for ways to um, to make a concrete difference. Great, thank you so much. I mean, we're, we're all so grateful for the work that you do. Um, so I wanna ask a couple of follow-up questions about some of the, the specific uh, ethical lapses we've seen over the last few years. Um, which you've definitely seen in your time at Crew. Um, Crew's been around for nearly two decades, but you know the so the scope and the just the volume of the kinds of really scary actions that we're seeing has increased dramatically over the last few years. Um, the most notable one, of course, is the January sixth insurrection. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the attempt to overturn the election came together? How close do you think we are to seeing something like that in the future? Um, and yeah, I would just love to hear your thoughts uh, on that specifically. Right. Um, I mean, it, it was it was obviously a singular moment in American history. Never before have we been that close to things completely falling apart. Um, but for anybody paying attention, it wasn't a surprise. Right. Um, you know, over the summer before the election, um, you know, folks in the Trump White House were breaking, um, you know, violating the Hatch Act, which uh, prohibits government officials from using their office um, for political ends and doing things like hosting the Republican 
convention um, on on the White House grounds and things like that. Um, so the you know the breakdown in sort of protections against um, corrupt and unlawful activity had been happening the whole time before the election occurred. There was you know a calculated campaign to get people to distrust the results before anybody had even voted, um, and obviously that picked up. Um, after the election um, and the January 6th committee has done a great job documenting, you know, that the folks who were perpetuating those conspiracy theories and lies knew exactly what they were doing. They were told that they, um, that, that there was no truth to the allegations of, of voter fraud in places like Georgia or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Michigan. Um, so, um, you know, all of those threads came to a head on January 6th. Um, and we, we were fortunate that people in key positions of power, like Vice President Pence, like some senior officials of the Department of Justice, um, decided not to embrace um, this effort to overturn the, the election results. Um, but you could imagine the story playing out very differently if um, they had made a different choice. Um, and I think um, something that's particularly concerning is that if Trump were Trump or somebody like him were able to try this again, I think you would see them surrounding themselves with people who have absolute loyalty to the mission. Um, you know, there wouldn't be a Vice President Pence, there would be somebody who would be willing to, to go to Congress and use uh, whatever power they have to, to overturn the results. Um, and then of course, we were lucky that the violence and the attack on the Capitol didn't result in injuries or, or the death of any members of Congress or Vice President Pence, right? I mean, that there were people there who that was their, for whom that was their objective. Um, and just because it didn't happen didn't, doesn't mean that that possibility is, is one we shouldn't be thinking about moving forward. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about there and um, I'm sure we'll get into various parts of it. Um, obviously it was such a, uh, especially for those of us who live in the DC area, it was, it was the sort of event you could, you thought would be the thing that um, brought us all together and made us all realize that we needed to turn a corner as a country. Um, obviously that's not how it's played out, right? Um, we now see candidates across the country embracing uh, election denialism um, and a calculated attempt to elect folks to secretary of state offices or other positions where they would uh, potentially be able to um, undercut the will of the American people. And so instead of having this you know, big moment where we repudiate um, the anti-democratic elements in our society, there seems to be um, you know, an effort on the right to, to build a party around the idea that uh, the American people shouldn't choose their leaders, uh, which is not something I imagine myself saying uh, 10 or, or 20 years ago. No, I, I mean, you know, I remember when the insurrection happened, I was working for J Street, working at home and just like watching it on CNN and it's happening a mile and a half down the road and thinking in, in my city, this is a real thing that's happening right now. And I know, you know, one of, one of my colleagues, Nate, who's actually um, helping on the back end of this call, lives very close to the Capitol and, and has written extensively about his experience. And so it's just so jarring to think both about the political realities, but also just what we all experienced as residents watching this happen in a normal city where we go about our normal lives. Um, and I think something else, something else that you've alluded to that is extremely concerning is the how easily this could have gone another way, if not for just a couple of voices of, of, of reason. Um, and again, people that, you know, you and I don't agree with on really anything, but they just happen to be standing up the right way this time. And I think in the last two years, we really have seen the Republican Party sideline almost all of these voices. Um, you know, these are people who have lost their primary elections or have decided to resign or just being really pushed out of the party. And I'm just thinking of, of one example of how these voices have shifted so much. Um, there's a there's a Michigan congressional district that is currently represented by Peter Meyer um, of, of Meyer Grocery Stores. Um, he voted uh, for <laughs> he voted for impeachment 
Um, and he lost his primary election to a man named John Gibbs, who, in addition to being an election denier, which now appears to be, you know, the litmus test for the Republican Party, has also said, you know, in, in increasingly out there things like that women shouldn't have the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, J Street endorses the Democratic challenger in this race, Hillary Scolton. Um, but this is just an example of the kind of race where you had what what once could have been, you know, a moderate Republican voice. And these are really just all being pushed out. And so it's so scary to think about um, what could come since there are no more voices of reasons left. And so I'm I'm wondering, Connor, if you can talk a little bit more about, you know, we've all, and I presume everybody on this call has been, you know, watching the hearings quite closely, or at least watching, you know, the recaps the next day. Um, there's been so much damning evidence revealed over the last, you know, few months. Um, where do you hope or think any of this intel will lead um, if Congress, you know, changes, if the Republicans take control of Congress uh, after this election, uh, what happens to that committee and are they still able to do any work that would be helpful for us? Sure, it's a great kind of question. Um, you know, I, if, if the balance of power changes in the House, the committee will, the committee's work will wrap up. Um, and, you know, they've been conscious of that possibility and the 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 work that they have done over the last year and a bit reflects you know the urgency they knew they had to work with to get um to the bottom of what happened um before time ran out um you know congress's responsibility here is not you know they have the ability to push for accountability but they don't have the same tools that the department of justice has so you know the fact that they will be able to release a detailed report that gathers the the facts that they've been able to uh, uncover is a huge step in the right direction. But now the onus will be on the Justice Department um, to seek indictments of uh, continue to seek indictments um, of folks who are responsible, criminally responsible for what happened. Um, and we now we know that the Department of Justice has not been sort of just waiting for that report to come out, right? Um, there, have, there are several grand juries that um, are gathering their own evidence. They've asked and have obtained evidence from the January 6th committee. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think one thing we can anticipate is, especially after the election has passed and DOJ is not constrained by um, sort of the norm of not taking investigative steps that could influence the election, you know, once once that period has passed, then they be, we might see more public activity in the form of indictments, um, you know, perhaps even up to the level of um, former President Trump, um, who obviously, you know, he's facing pressure from a, a variety of angles. But, um, you know, regardless of what happens with the Mar-a-Lago records, it's really important that he face accountability, accountability for January 6th because... Right. You know, um, it's great to go after after the Oath Keepers, the uh, the right wing militias that gathered on that day. Um, it's great to seek accountability for the people who entered the Capitol for whatever reason. Um, but at the end of the day, there was one person at the center of this conspiracy to defraud the American people of the, you know, um, the thing that mattered most, which was the peaceful transfer of power, the results of the 2020 election, um, and. Trump and the people who helped him really, really need to be held accountable for that. Um, we can't just pretend that they're buy into a fantasy that they will go away on their own. We need um, DOJ to, to deliver on that front. Um, so that those are two answers. The other one I'll point to is that um, a lot of folks have been talking about the um, 14th Amendment. Um, Section 3, um, hadn't received a lot of attention before the, the events of the last uh, couple of years. Um, but that um, precludes anybody from holding um, office if having previously sworn an oath to the Constitution, they engage in an act of insurrection. Um, and so one of the things that Crew has done is tried to um, actually enforce that provision. Um, and over the summer, we had um, a victory in a state court in New Mexico, um, which enforced that provision for the first time in 100 years. Um, so the question now is, um, can we get more courts and perhaps even legislatures like uh, the House of the Senate um, to think about whether um, there are individuals who are barred from holding office um, because of their role in the January 6th insurrection? 
Um, and so, you know, we and others will be looking for ways to um, to encourage folks to do that because it's not, you know, th this wasn't um, this wasn't just a random collection of folks who happened to stumble into the Capitol. Um, it was the culmination of of a very serious and wide ranging effort to to try to overthrow um, the elected government, um, and that's. Uh, there have to be consequences for that. That's what this provision is there for. It was there created after the Civil War, which is the last time we faced, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a threat to our democracy of, of this scale um, and significance. So, um, yeah, that's. I think that's the other important avenue that people should be talking about and focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was just about to ask you about that um, that decision, which is you know very exciting. So. I'm sure, you know, congratulations. I'm sure it was an unbelievable amount of effort and coordination. Um, but it is a, you know, a, a, dare I use the, the word exciting legal precedent. Um, and I know you said that you're going to be looking into, um, you know, other state legislatures and other areas where, you know, we might be able to use this section to hold people accountable who participated in the insurrection and bar them from holding office. Um, there are people who participated in the insurrection who are running for Congress right now. And I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit more about this um, about this effort and what some of the barriers are to getting um, this section of the 14th Amendment enforced. Sure. Um, so a big question is going to, especially for folks in Congress, um, you know, there are a few people on the ballot who are not currently representatives um, who are at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and they're kind of, they occupy a unique space because they're more similar to the defendant in the um, the New Mexico case, Coy Griffin. Uh, they, you know, they were active participants in the, in the mob um, that proceeded towards the Capitol. And some of them may have actually breached the um, sort of police lines there. Um, and so those cases are more similar to, um, you know, they're similar to the, um, the precedent that we've established. And I think um, they might be really strong candidates for exclusion under the 14th, uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, we're interested in, in talking about other ways that folks participated in the insurrection on January 6th. Um, the January 6th committee has detailed um, the participation of, I believe, 10 um, representatives um, in meetings at the White House in December of 2020, where, you know, which was around the time where they decided to focus on co Congress's certification of the election um, and Vice President Pence's role in that process as being sort of um, the, the day and event that they should apply pressure to. And that's around the time that they started to announce um, that there would be a rally on January 6th at the Ellipse. Um, and it was around the same time that folks in the violent um, extremist uh, circles started to get excited about actually showing up that day. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's fair to question whether those members are barred um, from service by, um, by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, there are some procedural things that would need to happen. Um, you know, ordinarily it takes, I believe, two thirds, um, a two thirds vote to kick somebody out um, of a, a House of Congress. Um, but sitting somebody at the beginning of a Congress is a little bit different. Uh, it only takes a majority vote to exclude them. Um, it has to be a constitutional, um, there has to be a constitutional problem with their um, assuming office. So the constitution doesn't have that many restrictions, right? Age is, is one of them. Um, citizenship um, is another. Um, but um, the 14th Amendment is part of the constitution, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's a strong argument that um, you could use that process to enforce Section 3 and just stop somebody from being seated by a simple majority vote. Um, you know, the, the problem with, uh, with bodies of Congress enforcing these rules is that ultimately it comes down to whatever majority is in power. Mm -hmm. um, so the question remains, will there be a majority in the next Congress 
that is interested in barring insurrectionists from holding office, or will there not be? Um, and you know, we won't know that until after the elections. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions lining up already, so I'm just going to ask one more before I open it up. But if you do have a question for Connor, please feel free to put it in the Q and A. Um, so. J Street's political work this cycle is focused on electing pro-peace, pro-democracy champions to Congress. We've endorsed 175 House and Senate candidates who will do just that. Um, what else, as individual citizens and as allied advocacy groups, can we do to protect democracy? Not all of us are lawyers. Um, so what else can we do to be good partners in this fight and do everything that we can for this most important question? Um, it's a good question. And I, you know, anybody who's been motivated over the last uh, several years, I'm sure faces um, almost, you know, a sense of exhaustion in some respects. Like you can't, I remember in the early days of 2017, it felt like you needed to show up to a protest in person every weekend to, um, you know, uh, to save our, our country. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's important, first of all, just to, to maintain hope. Um, you know, you have to, 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 uh, to believe that these fights are worth fighting, you have to have hope for our country, and I, I do. Um, you also have to be willing to, you know, not not get overwhelmed by the day to day sort of big picture fights that you can't really impact, mm -hmm. um, and try to look for things closer to home that you can. Um, you know, and I, I think there's been a growing realization that the problems that we face, um, like in Congress or at the federal level. Um, you know, some of their roots are in, in problems that we have yet to address in the local level. You know, mm -hmm. you can support efforts to get money out of politics um, in local elections, and that will have an influence eventually on the federal level because the people who are rising up through the ranks are are going to start out, um, you know, running for your local council or for mayor or things like that. Um, and the protections against corruption at that level are, are even fewer and far between often than they are at the federal level. Um, so, you know, I'd encourage people to look for, you know, it's great to support national efforts to um, save our democracy. Um, but if those feel overwhelming, you can always um, turn your eyes closer to home. I, I will say, especially judicial elections in um, localities, you know, the federal level, we've appointed judges and that provides some degree of independence, but the local level, um, it, yeah, some degree. Um, at the local level, um, often judges are elected and that can be an important opportunity to, um, you know, to make sure that folks seeking those offices um, believe in the rule of law and accountability and things like that. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, and I appreciate the note about hope, which is an important part to, to hang on to. It's, it's a long fight. Um, so I'm going to open it up for our audience Q&A right now. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. And I'm going to go first to Earl Barg, who's from Texas. Hi, Earl, um, who says, do election officials in general have legal liability to uphold state election laws? And are there states where there's any criminal liability if they don't? Um, I'm going to guess that the answer is it varies but I'll leave it to you, Connor, to try to take that. Um, I can't, I haven't done a 50 state survey of uh, criminal laws relating to um, uh, elections and uh, tampering with voting and things like that. Um, but we have done a lot of work in Georgia and um, assuming that their laws aren't far away from the median, I can tell you that there are many, many different criminal laws that protect against um, or provide for punishments for anybody who does interfere with the voting process. Um, and there also are federal laws. So it's not dependent just on um, a local DA pursuing a case. The, um, uh, the federal government can pursue uh, crimes, including a conspiracy against civil rights, um, which includes voting. So um, if more two or more people um, agree to try to uh, interfere with somebody's, uh, the counting of somebody's vote or the tabulation of votes, for example, um, that could potentially constitute a federal felony. Um, so there are severe consequences for that. And I think the problem is the laws on paper are not the same as laws that are enforced, right? And one of the reasons why it's so important for 
state authorities and federal authorities to seek justice for January 6th is that, you know, um, the deterrent effect of criminal law comes through it being enforced and people seeing like, look, these, these folks who tried to tamper with the election um, are, are getting convicted, they're going to prison. Um, I shouldn't try to do that because I'll face the same consequences. Right. Well, yeah, we're not so great at that among other areas as well. Um, another question I have for you, I know that you work for a C3 and can't advocate for specific bills, but Congress has tried to pass a number of election reforms in the last couple of, uh, in this in this Congress, um, which didn't, didn't pass. Um, are there specific policies that you think could be passed at the federal level outside of specific a specific bill um, that you think would be really helpful in trying to help, you know, restore ethics and accountability. Sure, and I, our restrictions aren't aren't that um, we're not, I'm not that restricted, in, okay. Like, okay. Not, so I can be a little bit more specific. Um, the Freedom to Vote Act um, mm -hmm. is a key one. Um, that is um, the sort of set of reforms that started out as HR one and the For the People Act, but then got narrowed down. Um, to what um, mm -hmm. Senator Joe Manchin and others would agree to. Mm -hmm. um, that still includes a significant number of important um, voting rights protections, including reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, um, which is a, uh, you know, was struck down by the Supreme Court, parts of it. Um, and that is a critical tool for um, ensuring the changes to voting laws in places with um, a history of uh, tampering with voting rights um, go through a pre-clearance process. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of them. But also in there are national standards for um, things like early voting, voter registration, um, that would be really a, a huge step forward in just providing certainty and regularity to a process that right now seems to change every year, depending on what state you're in. Um, CREW has also come out in support of things like um, DC statehood, um, which um, you know, one of the one of the big problems we have at the federal level is just that our our political system is increasingly um, not majoritarian, right? It doesn't reflect what people want to see um, in their. It, it doesn't reflect the the actual um, preferences of the American people. So. Um, DC state would, statehood is an imperfect way of getting there, but it's a step in the right direction, and it also helps enfranchise a significant number of folks. Um, so that's something um, that's, that also should be part of the conversation. Um, it's not exactly voting rights, but um, the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which is a series of um, series of efforts to sort of turn norms or um, institutional failures that we've noticed over the last um, several years to, to address those and, and, and turn them into sort of like enforceable laws, um, provide more checks and balances against um, a president like Trump who really pushes the bounds of what, of what laws will allow. Um, th that's another crucial piece of legislation that we, we support and hope to advance um, whenever there's a chance to. Great, thank you. Um, so here's another question that is a little bit more about this upcoming election. We've laid out some of the, you know, what I'll say like like trouble spots where there are genuine issues with election security. We've talked about uh, threats to election workers. We've talked about election deniers on the ballot, all of these items. When you look at the midterm elections, what are you mostly paying attention to? What are you and crew worried about? And what are you focusing on? And what should we be paying attention to um, at this election point? Um, this is where I am more restricted. I can't advocate for candidates, but, you know, um, it does matter. Ultimately, the, the more election deniers who get elected, the more people who are uninterested in enforcing the rule of law who get elected, the harder our, our challenge will be. Um, so we, you know, we certainly, the, the balance of power that results from the election will certainly influence what possibilities there are for um, legislative reforms in Congress. Um, it will make clear, you know, how many states are at risk of, um, mm -hmm. uh, of having 2020-like problems with election mm -hmm. certification or how many people 
will be elected to and um, holding positions of authority to potentially manipulate with results. So, um, you know, it's sort of uh, yeah, it's it's setting the stage for for what could be the next big fight about the future of our democracy. And um, we certainly, you know, we're certainly interested in, in figuring out what that landscape will look like. Um, but, um, but yeah, the fight for, you know, the fight for accountability involves Congress, but that's not the only thing. And I think um, folks should be encouraged by what the Department of Justice has been up to. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, those folks are not elected, they will continue to hold their jobs at least for the next two years. And that's uh, an important window to work with, no matter what the results of the midterms are. Right. Well, that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to take a minute here to plug J Street's uh, upcoming conference, which is in D.C. and online, December 3rd through 6th, where we're going to be talking about questions like these and more. Um, our conference, uh, and there's a, there's an image on the screen, thank you. Um, our conference uh, theme this cycle, as you can see, is Living Our Values, Defending Democracy. Uh, it's coming right after key elections in both Israel, um, which we haven't talked about very much on this call, but is also facing a number of, of anti-democratic um, and, and some really scary election trends as well. So it's gonna come right after key elections in Israel and the US. Um, Jamie Raskin is gonna be uh, are speaking at opening night about some of his experiences um, with this kind of work in Congress. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of exciting voices from both Israel and American politics. So if you are interested in joining us for these conversations, um, you can register at jstreet.org slash conference. Um, and I hope to see you there. Again, that's in DC. Um, it's also online if you can't make the trip, but we would love to see you here. Um, so Connor, I want to thank you so much. We've covered so much ground today um, at all different levels of government and all different, you know, circumstances. Um, I'll do one final call for any questions that folks have, um, but I don't see any right now. So with that, I'll actually just turn it back to you and see if there's anything else that you want to leave us with, either about your work, uh, your personal opinions, um, or anything else we should be thinking about or doing going forward? Um, sure. I'll just say that, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't talked a lot about the Mar-a-Lago mm -hmm. records um, side of things. Um, and, you know, there are a couple, there are a few different things to say about it. One is that, you know, it is, um, I think it demonstrates that Trump in particular is going to keep on breaking laws, no matter how severe or, um, you know, how reckless it, it looks until he's held accountable. Um, and, you know, it's almost, it's just astounding that somebody with, you know, a, a, an, an amazing array of tools at their disposal would put themselves in such clear jeopardy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been encouraging to see how quickly the Department of Justice has moved on that. Um, but I think the lesson we have to learn from it is just that, um, you know, accountability is not going to have its own, happen on its own. It has to be actually enforced and um, and, and delivered. So, um, you know, I think uh, it, it's yeah, it's been great to see how how quickly they've they've jumped mm -hmm. on that, um, and because they have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've we've been tracking. We have a tracker on our website of uh, that just tallies the credible allegations of of crimes uh, against Trump, and I think we're up to fifty five now, uh, and that number seems to grow uh, every day. Um, there was just a decision in uh, mm -hmm. in a California district court about John Eastman's emails. Um, mm -hmm. He is one of the lawyers at the center of those sort of legal efforts to undermine the twenty twenty election. Uh, and the judge there decided that the January 6th committee could have more of his emails, have access to them um, because they were in furtherance of um, a crime. Um, and he also noted that um, the emails showed that Trump had personally um, mm -hmm. misrepresented facts to a federal court in Georgia um, in one of the cases that he and his campaign brought to um, uh, to cast out on the results of the election, which is in and of itself probably another crime, perjury or a false declaration to a court. Um, so, you know, we're we just we're getting to the point where um, the, the need for accountability is just so obvious and so strong 
Um, and I am hopeful that we are finally, after years and years of this, on the cusp of, of, of getting what we need. Well, that sounds like a great note to end on. I love the optimism. And I just want to say, Connor, thank you so much for joining us today. And also, and I, I know I speak for everyone on the call, thank you so much for the work that you all are doing. Um, someone needs to enforce this accountability. And we're really, really, really grateful um, that you and your colleagues are pursuing justice in this way. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for calling in um, for today's uh, JStream. Um, and I just want to uh, thank everyone again. I hope to see you at the December conference in DC. Um, and with that, I'll wish everyone well. Take care. Thanks, Laura.